So let's open it up again. I know there are people who are raising their hands, but if you could just submit your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, we will do our best to get to all of the questions or as many of them as we possibly can. So here's a question. Having cystectomy in a few weeks, is cytology the only way to detect any remaining bladder cancer after surgery? Um, I'll answer that if it's okay. So uh, cytology is not the only way to determine if there's residual cancer left. Um, it's one way, although I don't think it's really very routinely used. Um, some uh, certain situations or special situations, certainly um, some centers may try to perform a bladder biopsy before cystectomy um, to determine if there's any residual disease, although that's not really routine and it's certainly not considered standard of care. Um, cytology, I imagine, will often be negative in patients, uh, maybe, uh, for instance, who have had chemotherapy, uh, where there may not be a very high burden of disease left in the bladder, or maybe no, maybe no tumor, or, or the tumor might be sort of um, more into the wall of the bladder rally, rather than interfacing with the, the urine. Um, and so I don't think cytology is typically used uh, uh, for those reasons. Okay. All right. Why, if after a prostatectomy and then radiation, do they not normally do cytology to see if the radiation cystitis is not changing into bladder cancer? So, so one of the other scenarios, you know, I talked about BCG. Um, Radiation to the bladder also can very frequently um, cause, uh, particularly atypia. It will all, all usually cause atypia of the of the bladder, and that's because it it has an inflammatory response. Um, now, with the question why why isn't so why aren't we doing screening urine tests in patients who have had radiation for prostate cancer? Well, when you actually look at the data, the, the rates of bladder cancer after radiation for prostate cancer on a population level are very low. Now, uh, people who treat a lot of bladder cancer like myself and Phil, we tend to see many of those patients, but, but the point is, is it's still certainly single digit percentages. And so if we were to do a screening test, it could also lead once again to overtreatment uh, because it's just not good enough of a urine test yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a unique question in that, what tests are used with neobladders or any kind of diversion if they're still checking urine? What are they looking for there at that point in time if there's no bladder material there? Yeah, good question. So I routinely do not get uh, cytology tests in patients who have uh, had a cystectomy, whether, it was, whether they had a diversion with a neobladder, an ileal conduit, a continent cutaneous diversion, et cetera. What ends up happening um, for patients who have had a cystectomy and know, you always have this sort of like inflammatory snot that just, it's, it's mucus that comes from your bladder, so, sorry, from your, from your bowel, your, now your, which is now integrated into your, your, your urinary tract. And so that sort of, back, there's a lot of bacteria, there's a lot of mucus. Um, it really ends up being non-diagnostic, um, uh, essentially almost 100% of the time. So I really do not use, and I think most oncologists don't use um, cytology routinely after cystectomy. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I do not check cytologies after a cystectomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Case, you've already mentioned that you do research with CX bladder, but um, somebody was asking about your opinions as a follow-up test or used in conjunction with cytology. What are your thoughts on that? Phil, do you wanna answer that one? Uh, oh, well, I guess if you're not comfortable, I, I, I mean, I think, so I don't use bladder CX very much. Um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it has impressive, um, um, uh, data, like from the clinical, from the perspective, you know, uh, observational, uh, clinical trials. Um, I think, uh, I, I imagine, um, it might be used maybe to adjudicate as we talked about. Um, I don't know that it replaces cytology. It's probably more sensitive for cytology, especially for lower grade um, tumors. Um, Max, I'll, I'll let you, you're sort of the expert. I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I use, I do use that test, um, but I use it. I, every patient uh, is, is a little different and they have their own unique circumstances. I think when cytology works well, I have, I have some phenomenal cytopathologists who read our cytology. So I trust them a lot. Uh, and when it works well, it works very well. And then I use these other tests, notably CX bladder to help adjudicate when there's questions and when there's questions both on my side and when the patient's not comfortable. Um, so when there's questions on both sides. Well, you brought up a good point, Dr. Keith. Um, you're both affiliated with large academic institutions, so you probably have top-notch cytologists there that are looking at all of these things. They see a lot of samples. What about somebody who's being seen in their community practice, you know, where they might not be looking specifically for bladder cancer per se? I mean, what are your recommendations there in terms of, you know, what's the general practice that you know of from people who are treating patients in the communities, not affiliated with the great resources that are at your institutions. So I can comment on that. Um, one of my clinics is kind of an out, outreach clinic and some of the, ur the urine samples that we get actually are sent to a third party where they don't go to a, you know, they don't go to the, the pathologist at where, where I have clinic, uh, like my academic center, they go to a, a commercial entity and that commercial entity gets probably in the thousands of urine samples, you know, every week or every, maybe even every day, I'm not sure. But they, you know, they certainly have people who are very experienced looking at these things, you know, day in and day out. I mean, there's, there's probably people who only look at urine cytopathology specimens. And so that, you know, that sort of repetition and that familiarity with what they're looking at um, makes those, those uh, pathologists very good at what they do. So if you're in a small community and your, your sample, for instance, is being sent to, uh, you know, like I, I know a, 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 the place we send ours is called Dianon, but there are certainly third party commercial entities that do um, urine cytopathology, even if, even if you don't have a, you know, high powered cytopathologist in your hospital. Okay, good. Good information to have. Thank you. So how often should you have urine cytology done while on BCG? How soon after you've had BCG can you have your next cytology? Uh, you know, I, I, I think that what I do is I do a cystoscopy uh, for surveillance um, and I get a cytology at the time of cystoscopy. So I typically will do a cystoscopy about four weeks after um, patient finishes BCG and, um, and I'll get a, a urine cytology at that, at that same time. Yeah, I agree. There definitely needs to be an interval after the BCG before the cytology is, is obtained because as, as Max had said several times, BCG causes a pretty significant inflammatory reaction. A lot of those samples will be, uh, atypical. And again, I, I, I don't tend to really pursue atypical cytologies unless there's something I see in the bladder that I'm halfway suspicious about and might want to do a biopsy for. But even actually, I mean, and along those lines, I guess, even after BCG, there's a lot of inflammatory lesions in the bladder. Um, a lot of times I'll just kind of watch and wait and it, you know, I'll make a note of it on my cysto note. And when the patient comes back three months later for their cysto, you know, I know exactly where to look and, and I'll make a note about what it looked like. Um, and so, you know, we're able to spare a lot of people you know, anesthesia, biopsies, et cetera, just by being patient because we know that BCG causes a lot of these inflammatory uh, reactions in the bladder. Thanks. Yeah, you just answered two questions at once, so I've already knocked the other one off the list. So here's another question. Um, Paloma virus, what are the morphologic characteristics and what is the significance of this finding if you have that reported in your cytology? So polyoma virus is a, is a virus just like many other viruses that can infect um, cells in your body. Uh, one of the cell types it can infect is in your bladder, the urothelial cells. Um, you will often see changes like atypical changes of, of a, uh, uh, of a uh, that you might see on a cytology. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact um, changes you like on a microscopic level, but I think they are associated with um, atypical, like uh, atypical nuclear shape. Um, you'll often see um, chromatin that looks abnormal, and then there may be um, there may be inclusion bodies. I can't remember from my pathology 
textbook, Mac, Max, if you have any. If you I'm impressed with how far you've gotten already. Yeah, but it's 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 essentially it, you know it's a it's a uh, benign virus that causes a benign change in the in the um, the the uh, what the the what the cytology looks like of the of the cells that are infected with it. Okay. Here's an interesting question, partially related to psychology, uh, excuse me, cytology. But do you have any other suggested workup or expert opinion for persistent undiagnosed microhematuria with negative? Cystoscopy. Um, I certainly see a lot of. I, I, I in addition, you know, I, 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 my practice is is actually a lot of general urology, so I see a lot of microhematuria patients. Um, we see a lot of patients with persistent microhematuria. Um, often, those patients, after they've had a negative workup, including, um, uh, you know, normal cystoscopy, normal CT scan, um, potentially multiple normal cystoscopies negative or benign cytologies. Um, often those patients, you know, are, are patients with um, uh, blood pressure problems, uh, diabetes, cholesterol, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. Um, I suspect that a great number of those patients with persistent microhematuria have, uh, have th that where that blood comes from is probably from their kidneys where because patients with high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, um, vascular disease tend to have abnormal kidney function where their kidneys let things through that they're supposed to filter um, and retain, um, rather than filtering and, re and retaining, they, they filter and those things leach out. And so you get blood in the urine that comes from a kidney source that's really just re related to their other medical comorbidities rather than, you know, a bladder cancer, a kidney stone, an upper tract cancer, et cetera. Here's a specific one. What do you think of the test bladder epicheck by Nuclix? Um, I don't know that one. Um, I, is that? Yeah, so I, I offhand don't, don't know it or use it. It, it sounds like it's probably an epigenetic test, but I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a, a little bit of a technical question. Couldn't the role of artificial intelligence, <clears throat> um, or isn't there a role for artificial intelligence in eliminating all too frequent atypical findings? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I was actually just talking about artificial intelligence and uh, uh, machine learning with my kids this weekend. So, uh, in theory, um, the, the, the problem, um, or one of the obstacles, I should say, with using machine learning to, um, to uh, maybe make, to eliminate the idea of an atypical cytology would be that you have to know the outcome. So if someone has an atypical cytology, what does that mean? And like, because when you do machine learning or artificial intelligence, um, you have to, like what your, your, your image, your, your, um, you know, your cytological image that you're feeding into the computer has to be associated with an outcome. And if we don't really have a, a strong connection with an outcome, um, you know, the, the information you're putting into the system is, sorry, the, the information you get out of the system is only as good as the information you put into the system. So if you don't have good information going in, you're not going to have good information going out. Um, I imagine there's probably a way to do it. It would require, I think, longitudinal samples from patients with atypical cytology to identify those few percentage of patients that actually end up having a cancer diagnosed so that you could tell the machine, um, you know, these are the ones that were, that ended up being positive and these are the ones that end up being, you know, not, or not positive or not positive yet. Um, and so I think, uh, there, there's probably a way to do it, but I think it's going to take somebody a lot smarter than me and Max. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a general question in terms of you're a researcher, Dr. Abbas. How can your cytology be improved in the future? What cases um, do you think it will um, be helpful to increase the accuracy? How do you think this is going to work? I know you're working on some interesting studies. What can you tell us about this future of urine cytology? Sure. So I think, you know, the, the future, we're sort of seeing the future now. I think with bladder CX and these other sort of molecular tests where um, scientists and companies are looking at, um, 
uh, uh, nucleic acids that are shed by the tumor um, into the urine and those things can be measured. I think that's probably where the future of this is going. Um, uh, I don't know if these will ever replace cytology. I mean, they may replace cytology. There's certainly gonna be a cost issue. Um, and there's also gonna be uh, you know, an issue of where and when do you use each of these tests. Um, uh, you know, certain tests will be um, effective in low-grade tumors, and certain effect, uh, tests may be uh, better in high-grade tumors. Some tests may be better in uh, surveillance when we know someone has a history of bladder cancer. Um, there are certain tests that may be better when it, we don't know if a patient, when, when someone just comes in with a fresh diagnosis of hematuria. Um, I personally believe in, like, the nucleic acid. I, I think that's you know, whether it's mRNA or DNA, um, where you're measuring alterations in those, in those nucleic acids, which are um, uh, strongly associated with cancer. Uh, I think that's, you know, I mean, that's where our lab has invested a lot of time and effort um, and certainly where, you know, our funding has been. Um, so that, that's, that's what I think. I mean, my, my hope is that what, what we're working on is maybe clinically available in you know, sometime in the next five to 10 years. That would be awesome. Okay. Okay. If you had papillary, not carcinoma in situ, high grade bladder cancer, um, is it also important to get urine cytology to check for cancer return with the papillary type? You were mentioning very heavily the carcinoma in situ. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that that is a good. All of these scenarios are, are your cytology is helpful. I would say the areas where it's not helpful is a, a history of low grade cancer um, is where it's not helpful. The other scenarios, it's helpful. Yeah, I agree with that. Great. Um, have you ever noticed an atypical result patient turned out suspicious or high grade over time? Um, I can't recall one off the top of my head, but I, I'm, it seems very plausible to have something like that happen. Um, as I mentioned, I use, uh, I, I may sometimes pursue um, an atypical cytology uh, with like a biopsy, maybe next time they come in for their cysto or in the operating room. Um, uh, but that, uh, that's not necessarily the same scenario as the, the person asked the question had. Um, that's more where I'm biopsying someone that has atypical as opposed to watching a cytology become positive over time. I don't know, Max, have you had that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I would answer it is, um, you know, typically when I'm getting cytologies, I'm also, I'm getting it as an adjunct to cystoscopy and to imaging periodically, CT imaging. And so uh, I'm not really concerned about the atypical because usually I'm gonna be getting another cytology at another time interval, you know, three months, six months later, and so at some point, uh, you know, a patient can have a recurrence, but it's not clear to me that that meant that they had cancer when they had the atypical cytology. Well, it'd be nice if we had a crystal ball we could see in the future, but um, looking at a question here, how confident are you about biomarkers-based diagnoses over cystoscopy? Do you think this is really gonna be where it's going? Um, I'm right now, I'm more of a seeing as a believing person. Um, you know, when I see a tumor, I, you know, I, I know what it is. Uh, it, it would be, I mean, you could, Matt, Max sort of mentioned the, the scenario where you've evaluated someone's urethelium and they have a positive urine cytology, but it could be a positive urine test of any kind, um, whether it's a cytology or, or some other uh, sort of a test. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the question, I think, I think where that question is going is if, if someone had, you know, how am I going to make a clinical decision when everything looks normal, but a urine test is abnormal? I don't see myself, you know, counseling someone that they need to have their bladder removed on account of an abnormal urine test when everything else looks normal. So you sort of have to contextualize the abnormal test with what you see you know, what does what the clinical scenario really bring to you? I would echo that. And, and maybe the question was also asking, well, will it replace cystoscopy? And 
my answer to that is, is I'm a data guy and I, I want as much data as possible to make a good decision with the patient. So I view all these tests as being combined, but I don't love the idea of replacing anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here's a very specific question. What does poorly preserved degenerating cells mean in a cytology report? How do you read that? Um, so this is probably related to um, what I had mentioned about um, getting a, an early morning void. So if um, an, an early morning, morning void will have a very high concentration, which tends to preserve those cells, um, a, uh, a, a urine sample right after you got drinking, got done drinking, you know, a big jug of juice or coffee maybe, um, where the urine won't be, will be a little bit more dilute, may not preserve those cells. It's also possible, say, in the setting of um, an infection or maybe after a, a cystectomy where someone has um, uh, an ileal conduit, for instance, uh, the, 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 whatever normal urethelium is present may have been eaten up by those bacteria or, uh, or the yeast or whatever is growing in the, um, in, the, uh, in the conduit. That was a great answer. I was an answer of verbose pathologist. <laughs> but in all seriousness, okay. you, that's a perfect example of sort of what can be on pathology reports. And if you don't see the word cancer on there, it, it usually means it's not cancer. That's good to know. Okay. So <clears throat> here's another related question to post-radical cystectomy. Wouldn't cytology for a person with a neobladder or in any other type of diversion indicate whether there was a recurrence in the ureters, kidneys, not the urethra because they well, possibly the urethra for somebody with a neobladder, but not with the other two. But um, wouldn't this indicate a possible recurrence of the cancer somewhere else in the urinary system? Um, theoretically, yes. But as, as Phil mentioned, the issue is that the new, uh, whatever the, the urinary reconstruction is, is sloughing off so much cells that it um, it's, it skews the picture. It makes the test not interpretable. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really almost like a, a question of dilution. So if, you know, the, the, uh, even if someone has a normal bladder before cystectomy, um, the amount of urethelium um, that, that is contributed to your urinary tract by the ureters and the, and the urethra is probably 5% or less. So even, even if you have a, um, even if you have a, 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 a positive, let's say you have a, a, a renal pelvis tumor, um, still probably a, a good proportion of the cells that are in your urine cytology are gonna come from the normal parts of the bladder. So if you, um, if you replace the, uh, the bladder with an ileal conduit or with a neobladder, your, uh, the amount of cells that are sloughed off by the conduit are now probably tenfold more than they were just when you had a bladder. So imagine, you know, there's already very, very few cells in the cytology that will be positive from the urethra or the renal pelvis. Those are drowned out now even more by whatever's coming from the conduit. So it just, it's, it's you're, you're kind of trying to find a needle, needle in the haystack with, with a, uh, um, a cytology after cystectomy, in my opinion. And, and in the upper tract and in the renal pelvis, we can identify even subtle tumors with a good CT scan. Um, and this is why we do CT imaging after, uh, or MR imaging after, uh, you know, a cystectomy. Okay, we have time for just one more question to be mindful of everybody's time. How do you grade bladder cancer based on cytology reports findings? Is it you as the urologist who are grading this or is it the pathology report? And what information are they using to grade um, that type of cell that they're seeing? Uh, so the pathologist is the one that assigns the grade. Um, uh, in, in some of the reports that I get, they actually will put pictures of the cells that are either normal or abnormal. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, the pathologist scores it and then I'm using that clinical data 
to guide what comes next for the patient. 